Okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about um, a study done by uh, a famous sociologist who happened to be an African-American sociologist named E. Franklin Frazier. Powerful study. Frazier was also at the University of Chicago, like William F. Ogburn and many others you've read about and heard me talk about. Uh, he got a PhD at a time when it was extraordinarily unusual for anybody to get a bachelor's degree, let alone an African American to get a PhD. He was a very influential man in lots of ways and a very optimistic man about the racial interaction future of America. And that may sound surprising, particularly after you hear this study of his. He was very curious after traveling why in the world that blacks and whites, people of African descent, people of European descent, got along so much better in Brazil and some other nations than they did in the United States. And particularly since Brazil had a slave history as well, and the United States had a slave history. He said, what's the difference? Why do blacks and whites intermingle, socially get along better? And uh, it's not that it's free from problems, but it's just a lot less problematic than what he saw between whites and blacks in America. And so he did a comparative study, and I'd like to compare that for you with several major points here. And I'll try to show you on one hand what happened in Brazil, and then on the other hand what happened in the United States. If you look at, at uh, this study, Frazier's not the kind of guy that's trying to make excuses for anything, but he is arguing that culture is like water for a fish. Culture impacts us dramatically in ways we don't even understand. My grandmother affected my mother, and my mother and father affected me, and I affected my children. My grandmother was born in, in uh, the late 1870s in Ireland. And her attitudes, even though unspoken directly to me, undoubtedly impacted my behavior. And Frazier said the same thing's true of people of African descent and people of European descent, that even though they didn't ex in experience a particular situation such as slavery directly themselves, that they both have been impacted in cultural ways that continue to the present. Now he doesn't want to use this as an excuse, what he wants to use is an explanation to help people understand one another better so that people can pick up and say, okay, where do we go from here? How do we get along? How do we become a united group of Americans? The first thing he points out is that in Brazil, they had highly isolated plantations. So that the only people on the plantations were the very few people of Portuguese descent who were white and the large masses of number of African descent who were the slaves and that were black. And that if anybody was going to have a Sunday baseball game or anything else that they were playing, that they had to do it together because the plantations were too far apart for that interaction not to occur. In the United States, and I'll put this on this side, in the United States, the plantations were closer together. So there was much more interaction between an elite group of white slave owners. On Sundays they would travel to each other's farms and play games and do all kinds of things, and much less social interaction between the blacks and whites. Number two, in Brazil, the plantations had upwards to 2,000 slaves. And of course, Africa, where they came from, even Western Africa is not one nation or one tribe, and these people had many different languages and cultures, but they had lots in common. And as a result of having 2,000 slaves per plantation, uh, they lost less of their African traditions. In the United States, only 15% of the farms in the South even owned one slave. And for the farms that did have slaves, it's very different than what we see on TV, of the farms that did have slaves, um, uh, let's see, of the farms that did have slaves, I'm losing my train of thought here. <laughs> you have to cut this out. Well, that's all right. That's just, okay. just start whenever you do get, get your okay. idea, so we can add it. <laughs> of the farms that did have slaves, the average farm had 10 to 15 slaves. And so when you got the number of slaves that your farm could support, you, know, you had to ask the purpose, what was the purpose of slavery? Well, whites were making a profit off the hard work of blacks who were getting almost nothing. They were getting basic food and place to stay and couldn't have rights to try to get higher wages or anything. So uh, when you got 16 or 18 or 20 slaves, what do you do? You start selling slaves off. And what do you do? They often broke up families. And one of the things they often did was sell off the male of the family. And uh, it got rather tragic, in fact, in, in that way. Number three, 
in Brazil, there were uh, lots of successful violent revolts. And these were successful. You can go to Brazil today and find way out in the middle of nowhere villages that you swear you in the middle of West Africa. The people were so successful, they killed off all the whites in the plantation. They just got sick of being treated like this. They said, we're not going to live like this. And they slaughtered the whites and then went off and, and uh, created their own, recreated their own society as if they were living in West Africa, uh, Gambia or someplace of that nature. And so they were able to keep African culture, again, that seems to be a theme here. In the United States, uh, no successful revol revolts. There were certainly plenty of attempts for revolts, but they were all put down with the exception of one big one in the Caribbean. Number four, they had the precedent in Brazil of abolishing, through the Catholic Church abolishing Indian slavery. The Catholic Church had argued that Indian slavery was wrong and immoral and all that good stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. Middle of taking my interrupt. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was standing in front of the camera. I don't think he saw me. Oh, okay. <laughs> he had a joke to tell me on the way down. Oh. He said, I'm, down, I'm going down taping, Paul. Okay. They had the precedent of abolishing Indian slavery in Brazil. In the United States, they, we had abolished white indentured servitude. You know, the, the thing where you might be an Irishman and, and uh, sacrifice seven years of your life so you get passage over, and then when that seven years was through, you were no longer owned by that owner. So they both had that precedent. Number five, the Portuguese who settled, the white Portuguese who settled Brazil were Christians, but they had this African Moorish influence because the Moors had swept up through Africa, or from Africa, northern Africa, and brought Islam with them a couple of different times, and they had conquered a great deal of Western Europe. You don't often hear about that or think about that, but they'd had big impact upon Spain and France, and particularly Portugal. And one of the things that these Portuguese Christians took on was that they were having uh, multiple legitimate relationships, the men would have multiple legitimate relationships with women. They'd have one wife, and they would then have other mistresses that were considered legitimate by the society who could give birth to children that were able to inherit wealth. Well, that of course was very different in the United States, that the, the interracial sex was still going on in the United States, and we have all kinds of evidence of that. Uh, and some of it was rape, some of it was uh, consensual, some of it was raped by the white masters, etc. But what, what was going on in the United States in this slavery system was that uh, the Christians who had settled the United States South typically were of Protestant descent from Northern Europe and Western Europe, and they had strong biases against sex outside of marriage, of having anybody uh, be able to be a legitimate heir to you if you were not married to their mother. It didn't mean the sex didn't occur, because it certainly did occur, but that wasn't, uh, wasn't considered legitimate. So lots of anxiety about sex between blacks and whites in America. That didn't occur in Brazil. Lots of anxiety about it. So in the United States, the U.S. Christians not accept interracial Uh, unions. And that made a very strong, strong thing. In fact, I'll say something that will make that even more powerful, I believe. Number six, the Portuguese males did not bring their wives. They thought that they'd come over from Portugal and they'd make their killing. And they'd make a lot of money in Brazil, farming and mining and everything else, and they'd go back to Portugal and they'd be rich. Well, in the United States, in the U.S., both males and females came, husbands and wives came together. So, of course, 
if the wife found out about this interracial union between her husband, the master, and one of the African women, she put a lot of pressure and get very upset. And lots of very bizarre things happened as a result of that. Lots of anxiety in America about interracial sex. I think still presently we have some of that. And we certainly had lots of that back during that time period. Number seven, uh, the well-educated Africans became the basis in Brazil of the northern civilization. Why were they well educated? Well, the Portuguese realized there weren't enough of them to do all the high level jobs they needed, so they educated, they allowed the people who were capable to become accountants, to become managers, to run these huge plantations. They knew they couldn't do it by themselves. In contrast, what happened over here? In the United States, 14 states passed laws forbidding blacks, people of African descent, from learning to read and write. Now, it's rather ironic. It's rather ironic because, of course, in the United States, an ideology was developing that Africans were subhuman. And if they really were subhuman, why would you have to pass laws to keep from learning to read and write? So it's a very ironic kind of thing that occurred there. So while Brazil encouraged education because they needed the brains of these people, the United States passed laws forbidding education, which kept people down, obviously. And we know that education becomes power. Let me do a little bit of racing here, then we'll move on. We're down through point seven on each of these. I think we only have about 48 more points to go. <laughs> so, yeah. Point eight, again, Brazil on this side and U.S. on this side. Point eight on each side. Uh, the whites in Brazil saw interracial marriage and the children that came from that marriage or uh, bonding as adaptive. Why? Well, Brazil is closer to the equator than the United States. And what they found was that their children were much less likely to get skin cancer and all kinds of other skin-related diseases from, from the direct sun if they had darker skin. So instead of developing an ideology that hated black people, that hated black skin, that said that one was inferior, the Portuguese actually, who by the way were a lot darker than the northern Europeans themselves anyway, and they had also interbred to some degree with the Moors who had come up from Africa, they saw the babies that came out of these unions between white masters and black slave women as adaptive. And of course, what happened in the United States? People hated that mixture. People argued against that mixture. Whites and blacks argued against that mixture. Uh, so mulattoes treated sometimes good, treated sometimes bad, changed historically many times, but mulattoes had lots of problems, had difficulties. Number nine, in Brazil, you were either, if you were white, you were either rich or you weren't there. If you were in the United States, you were white, you were either rich or poor. In, in Brazil, in other words, there was no rich white planter class that was versing, uh, versus the uh, poor whites. If you were in Brazil, basically you're pretty good off. You're pretty well off if you were white. The difference here was you had poor whites in masses versus rich whites. And in fact, that was one of the bases of the Ku Klux Klan is the rich whites manipulated the poor whites so that the poor whites wouldn't take them over and realize that they might be the source of their problems. So the Ku Klux Klan came out and uh, managed to blame everything on other people like Catholics and Jews and particularly people of African descent and became a force of terror. So, uh, for example, if you take two groups, the Africans after being released from slavery and the Irish, who were very poor on average, you've got two groups who really had lots of problems with one another. Why? They were competing for the same poor jobs. You have poor white people and poor black people both scrapping for not enough to eat. And so hatred got developed even further. In Brazil, you didn't have that distinction. Number 10, they did not have a violent civil war. 
And of course, in the United States, we had a violent civil war that set family against family. And it was over really states' rights in general, not just the concept of slavery, but people, of course, blamed it on slavery and blamed it on black-white relationships and things of that nature. So they didn't have this animosity that came out of the Civil War. Number 11, they had no Reconstruction because they had no war. If you know what Reconstruction is in the United States, we had Reconstruction. We had carpetbaggers, whites coming down from the North trying to punish the South. One of the things that, uh, and take advantage of the South and make a killing and go back North, one of the things that Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln suggested before he was killed was that he said, you know, even though the South has tried to render this nation apart, we have got to do everything we can not to punish them, to bring brothers back together, or we will have hell to pay. It's kind of a, uh, a paraphrase of what he said, but he was very insightful. And of course, he was killed in his weak alcoholic vice president, uh, uh, Johnson, Andrew Johnson took over, and he just uh, didn't, didn't follow through. And radical Republicans from the North tried to punish the South, tried to really punish the South, humiliate them, and that led to more and more anger, of course. All right? Um, they abolished, we abolished slavery very quickly. And actually, you might be surprised, we abolished it 25 years before Brazil did. And I've got it on the wrong side here. They, they abolished slavery very slowly. And they did so in 1888. When did we abolish slavery? 25 years earlier in 1863. So we abolished slavery quickly. Slavery was going to fall of its own accord as, as industrialization occurred and all kinds of things occurred that mechanized the field work. That would have fallen on its own accord. So many people argue that this violent civil war really made things worse. But of course, how do you argue something so immoral being allowed to stand for a longer period of time? And then finally, if we look at the most important thing from a sociological point of view, is that the uh, people of African descent, the slaves in Brazil, were allowed to keep their African culture, because there were just too many of them for the whites to control. They kept their family, probably the most important thing right there. Families were not sold off and broken up hardly at all, because you had 2,000 slaves per plantation. In the United States, you had very few slaves per plantation. And the United States, culture, and family, I won't say they were destroyed because that's not true at all. In fact, the African family has been African American family has been one of the stalwarts that's tried to hold things together along with religion and everything else. But culture and family was assaulted in the United States. People of African descent had their culture question of value. Everything was trying to be hidden and put away, uh, denied that they ever had cultures with great civilizations. And the families were broken up as fathers were sold off, as mothers were sold off, as children were sold off. And when you break down a culture, one of the best ways to do it is to rip apart the family. And then you really hurt things for long term. Overall, oddly enough, E. Franklin Frazier, an African-American sociologist, concluded from this study that there were very clear reasons that I've just described of why the slave systems were different in the United States and Brazil, and that resulted in different relationships between people of African and European descent. But he also concluded, being a very optimistic man, that eventually this was, these two cultures were so much the same at this point that it was a caste line of color that divided whites from blacks. And that eventually this caste line of color would be erased and people would be treated, as uh, Martin Luther King tried to argue, treated on the basis of their character, not on the basis of their color. Uh, we've got a long ways to go on that one. Thank you.